President Obama calling for more well, globalization. True but what does the president-elect think about the that? American people, just like the German people. There is no global anthem, no global currency, no certificate of global citizenship. We pledge allegiance to one flag, and that flag is the American flag. So what is wrong with an America first policy? Or if anything, Fox News religion contributor Father Jonathan Morris joins us now. So American first, America first, if you picked up the front page of The Economist like a week ago, yeah. it had this uh, picture of President-elect Trump riding on a horse and old pictures of, uh, of George Washington and this yeah. idea that America first, this new nationalism. Is that a problem? Not only is, not, it, is it not a problem, um, I would say, but Government officials have a responsibility to put their country first. Now, only America is something deeply wrong with that, in my opinion. I think whether you, you talk about isolationism or when you talk about interventionism, either extreme is very bad. Uh, look at it like a family. You know, of course, a mom and a dad has a responsib responsibility first and foremost for their kids. Mm -hmm. And our national leaders have a responsibility first and foremost for their children, for the citizens of the United States. Mm -hmm. But when the cousin next door, right, is you know, going through a major, major health scare, you don't just say, hey, listen, you're not part of my immediate family. If you have the, a possibility to help a situation, then yes, and you have the resources to do it, then of course you have a moral responsibility to do but then so. But where is the line American. then when you look at something like the Syrian refugee crisis, right? Yeah. The Pope has been outspoken on this. Yeah. But you know what? The Pope is also not a political leader, and he has himself has said that. This is the responsibility of our elected officials to make that decision, and it's sure. a very hard one. It requires wisdom. We need wisdom in our leaders and we can give principles and I think the principle I laid out is hey we're all a human family right. sure. and so we can't say only America but yes we can say America first we, we don't want German leaders to say America first sure. we want American leaders to say that well and there's nothing wrong with saying there's a human family but there's a it's a big leap to then say it's global citizenship or no allegiance to your own country Ob I mean, look at obviously you were here last week uh, we were talking about Cuba the death of Fidel Castro where there is no religious liberty here in this country religious liberty uh, flourishes because governments matter and I think yes. rid religious leaders recognize that as much as anybody yes I think we we really have to we need wisdom you know and because these are really hard lines to draw and you have to say um, we need to, to figure out what is it that we're able to do um, and what, is our, what are our priorities. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you can go either way. And Father, I've been wanting to ask you this knowing you were coming on. Your take on people around the country burning the American flag. Disgusting. Because it is, it is obviously legally their right to do so. Um, but what do you think that message sends? You know, I have two brothers in the military yeah. and I called them and I asked their thoughts. And they said this flag represents so much more than just being a flag it yeah. is it is every war we have fought in. it is every president that yeah. has served this nation it has been on uh, you know coffins of our men and women who have served yeah. it has been given to mothers who have lost their own child serving this country so it just means so much more Abby you know thank God we're in a country um, that runs by the rule of law but just because something is legal doesn't mean it's right uh, and we have to remind ourselves that we need a we need citizens of virtue uh, and when we don't have a citizenry, citizenry of virtue, well, we're going to end up going way off track. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yes, we have to respect the, the right of free speech, but it doesn't mean that it's our, a good thing. Our founders talked about that. You need to have virtue in a citizenry in order to maintain our great republic. Uh, but as we go forward, it, it's not even just America first. It, most people forget and don't recognize how exceptional and special America is, how rare it is to have the freedoms that we have. In, in many yeah. parts of the world, you, know, you couldn't do what you do right now. That's right. Absolutely, and the, the, the whole American experiment was exceptional, the way our founding documents um, came to be um, in so many ways. And so, therefore, we have a responsibility. Also, internationally, globally, we have a responsibility, but we also have priorities. Father Jonathan Morris, always great to have you here Thank every you. Sunday. Thanks, Father. Good to see Thank you. you. State, Treasury, and Defense are considered the big three when it comes to cabinet jobs. Well, we know that Wall Street veteran Steve Mnuchin, you see his picture here, he's President-elect Trump's choice for Treasury Secretary. Democrats promise a big fight. He's just put a Wall Streeter in charge of the Treasury, and not just a random one, a guy who actually helped package all of those toxic mortgages, a guy who bought a bank that made its fortune by squeezing people hard on foreclosure. 
We also know that retired Marine General James Mattis will officially be announced tomorrow as Mr. Trump's choice for Defense Secretary. And by week's end, we are told we will know much more, including most likely the pick for Secretary of State. And in that conversation, part of the issue is whether Donald Trump Mitt Romney relationship takes another dramatic turn. Remember back in the campaign? In March, Mitt Romney, the 2012 Republican nominee, announcing he was a never Trumper. Think of Donald Trump's personal qualities. The bullying, the greed, the showing off, the misogyny, the absurd third grade theatrics. Now, remember the date there, March 3rd. Mitt Romney gave that speech. Donald Trump, same day, responds. Mitt did a big, big joke. Mitt is a failed candidate. He failed. He failed horribly. He let us down. Mitt ran, probably it was the worst run that most people have seen. He doesn't have what it takes to be president. Throughout the campaign, though, Trump, held, I mean, Mr. Romney held firm. Remember the Access Hollywood tape? Mitt Romney saying that convinced him even more so. No way. Can't vote for Donald Trump. Presidents have an impact on the nature of our nation and trickle, trickle down racism, trickle down bigotry, a trickle down misogyny. All these things are extraordinarily dangerous to the heart and character of America. But since the election, Mitt Romney has had dinner with Donald Trump, had meetings with Donald Trump. He's had a phone conversation with Donald Trump. He's under consideration for Secretary of State. Mitt Romney says everything he has seen from the president-elect since the election, impressive. I've had a, uh, a wonderful evening with uh, President-elect Trump. These discussions I've had with him have been uh, enlightening and interesting and, uh, and engaging. I've enjoyed them very, very much. Is it conceivable that this will happen this week, or is the fact that it hasn't happened by now uh, tell you that at least Donald Trump was not wowed, and General David Petraeus is on another Sunday show this morning, and a lot of people are saying that in some ways could be an audition of sorts for him. I've started to hear over the last couple of days that Trump is moving away both from Romney and Giuliani, who was another early frontrunner. Doesn't mean that it won't eventually be them. Things change very quickly in Trump's orbit, but the, the push and pull between the two of them has created a lot of room for another option, Petraeus being one of them. But I think that you're going to see other names in the next couple of days that are going to be out there. Again, it may eventually be Romney or Giuliani, but the fact that it hasn't happened yet has really opened up this process much more than we being thought. More under consideration than most people. Bob Corker, the senator from Tennessee, yeah. chairman yeah. of the Foreign Relations Committee. And he would be uh, more of a consensus pick, right. someone who could uh, be confirmed and also be acceptable to Democrats. I'm told by a, a source close to the president elect that uh, they are moving back to square one of sorts on the Secretary of State to echo Julie's uh, reporting that um, they are trying to figure out where exactly to go and uh, the idea that it's sort of narrowed down to uh, one or two people is is, right. is not the case. Of, it's striking to see Romney say what he did at Trump Tower. I mean, right. nobody was more impassioned and really after more heartfelt. I think Romney was truly offended by Trump. Right. And you know, now to see him, it's sort of this combination of equal parts, laudable uh, patriotism. He wants to serve his country. I think he really is a patriot. But it's also sort of this lifelong ambition that Romney has. He just wants it so bad. And it, he just can't hide it there at all, you know. It, is, it has been fierce. And a quick point to correct. I made the, the interview with Wolf Blitzer there where Romney talked about the trickle-down massage. That was before the Access Hollywood tape. Yeah. He continued to stay there. He continued to stay in that position after that tape came out. But what has been interesting is, is Romney's transformation, number one, saying how impressed <laughs> I am and I want to serve, but also the open campaigning from Trump loyalists, Kellyanne Conway publicly. Oh, and listen to Newt Gingrich here in the Laura Ingram show, not just saying he doesn't think Romney's good for the job, but essentially trashing the guy. <laughs> You have never, ever in your career seen a serious adult who's wealthy, independent, has been a presidential nominee, suck up at the rate that Mitt Romney is sucking up. I mean, I am confident that he thinks now that Donald Trump is one of his closest friends, that they have so many things in common, uh, that they're both such wise, brilliant people. Uh, and, that, and I'm sure last night at an elegant three-star restaurant in New York that Mitt was fully at home happy to share his vision of populism, which involved a little foie gras, a certain amount of you know, superb cooking, <clears throat> but was done in a populist, happy manner.
Newt with the light drop. I mean, he yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm not exactly. exactly I'm leg. still a little okay. confused it's about Newt. his. <laughs> he mentioned everything but frog legs there, which, which they also had to dinner. But look, a lot of resentment it's between Newt. Newt Gingrich, we have to point this yeah. out, and Mitt Romney, yes. stems back to December of 2011 in Iowa when the Romney campaign unleashed yeah. uh, just a barrage on Trump or, or on, on Newt. He's never gotten over it. But the question here is, uh, as Jonathan and Julie and you guys said before, the fact that this has taken so long, uh, Trump clearly is hearing uh, all the criticism. The Romney people, I'm told, simply don't know. And it makes uh, a lot of people who love Mitt Romney very uncomfortable to see him uh, out there in, in this position. But he would still take the job because he thinks oh, he can, and, you know, soften Trump for the world. And, and we fill the Inside Politics table each Sunday with reporters, not pundits, and we close by asking them to share a bit of their reporting to help get you out ahead of the big political news just around the corner. Julie Pace. Even before Donald Trump picks his Secretary of State, his team is starting to look at ambassadors for some of these plum jobs overseas, places like France, Italy, the UK. And this is another area where it looks like Trump is more likely to pick from the swamp than drain it. Some of these big Republican donors who eventually came around and donated to his campaign in the general election are expressing their interest in jobs, and I'm told they're getting a pretty warm reception from the transition team. And when it comes to ambassadors, this is just one of those areas where every time you have a new president, you get a lot of complaints about the influence of money in our politics, and yet it always seems to play out the same way. Always seems to. If they have a small island left over, maybe some volunteers <laughs> here at the table. Jonathan? Uh, I'm told that the Trump folks want to make Hyde Camp, Heidi Hyde Camp, the Ag Secretary, and Joe Manchin, the Energy Secretary. Now, this is a brainchild, I'm told, of, of Ranch Priebus, the former RNC chair, who's now going to be the, the Chief of Staff of the White House. The idea here, uh, not too subtle, is to take two Democratic senators out of the Senate who both happen to be what? Up for re-election in Trump states in 2018, put them in the cabinet, and add two seats to the GOP ranks. One complication, though. My understanding is the Hyde Camp actually prefers interior or energy rather than ag. So it could be some haggling there. But we'll watch that one. Some more announcements this week. We'll see if any Democrats among them. Jeff? So Donald Trump is heading to Iowa as part of his uh, victory uh, lap on Thursday. And Iowa Republicans uh, wonder if he's going to shake up the state's politics as he, um, um, as he arrives. Terry Branstead, the long-serving Republican governor, is being eyed to be the ambassador to China. He has long uh, relations uh, with with China. Um, he supported Donald Trump from the very beginning. I talked with a couple people in the Trump transition yesterday. They said, yes, he is indeed on the very top of the list for that. Not done, of course, but watch Iowa on Thursday when Donald Trump heads out there. President Xi lived in Iowa as a time, as a college student, Muscatine, Iowa, knows Terry Brand said well, so keep an eye on the state of Iowa. That would be an important, uh, a grown-up at a sensitive time in that relationship. Abby? Well, Donald Trump supporters voted for him because he wasn't a typical Republican, he wasn't a typical Democrat. His infrastructure plan, carrier deal, position on trade all fit into that mold. His aides this week uh, expressed some acknowledgement that he can't really break out of that mold. He can't really become a typical Republican once he gets to Washington. So we, we should look for this as a kind of frame for how to understand the Trump administration. He has to keep being the outsider in Washington, especially when it comes to sticking it to, bo to both his party and to the other side. That's the key to keeping his voters happy uh, for the next four years. Make everybody happy, but also disappoint everybody along the way, most likely. I'll close with this. The big cabinet jobs, understandably, are getting the big attention, but the president-elect's to-do list also includes includes expressing his preference for someone to lead the Republican National Committee. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie is the biggest name in this conversation at the moment. But there's talk that Trump top campaign aide David Bossie is interested. And Nick Ayers, a key member of Vice President-elect Pence's team, also gets mentions. So do several longtime GOT, GOP activists, some of them some from important states out there. The protocol is pretty simple after a White House win. It is the president's choice. Among those who presumably get input, though, is the man Jonathan just mentioned the current party chairman, Reince Priebus, now in line to be White House chief of staff. I'm told his conversations with friends about this choice in recent days have focused on finding a campaign veteran who will focus on the nuts and bolts, not a big ego who will look to create another Washington power center. You can read that, if you haven't already, as proof that Priebus is concerned about the Christie idea. But, I should make this clear, it is the new president's call and his alone. That's it for us this morning. 
actually think this is too soon, but he hasn't yeah. even been inaugurated yet. Post-election wounds run deep and uh -huh. long You're and right. hard. I'm telling you, I know from okay. experience. Okay, fair enough. The one thing I will say, too, is I was joking that it is like you, mm -hmm. you and I. People are going to view this election through whichever lens they voted in. There's a lot of raw wounds with the Democrats. I will say for Kellyanne Conway, right now, girl, just, just take a victory lap. These people that worked for Hillary Clinton's campaign, guess what they have? No future in politics. Nobody's going to hire them when you ushered in this historic loss for Democrats. And their careers and livelihoods are pretty much over. So why don't you just, you know, take a seat back, keep it calm. And, wow. I know. mean, like you guys do. After that little, you know, thing you guys had in the last box, at the commercial break, you're friends again. Well, for, yes. yes. And, and let me just say, Joel Benenson, who was one of the people that you just quoted, um, has, I think, a very future and bright career in politics. The guy got three presidents, was in charge of three presidential elections. So I'm pretty confident. But the wounds confident. of loss, trust the me, of, I was, I was no, no, part I get of a losing it, campaign. I've, it's very hard to get hired again when you usher in historic losses. But Look at Steve Schmidt. He ain't running campaigns. He's on at some network someplace. Well, he's on a pretty good network, but so it's not like not he's a good a network. He's not, it's not like he's not a, a good job. network. <laughs> the bottom line is that, um, look, I think Robbie Mook did a But he's not running campaigns. He's, he may not be running campaigns. I think Joel Dennison's going to be just fine. But where they ended up uh, conceding Robbie Mook that they did not measure the white vote properly. So I think he did take some responsibility for it. Look, it, emotions are raw. The one thing I will say to Kellyanne Conway, who I've known for a very long time, she's a good Jersey girl and I like her a lot, is take a step back. I've been up and I've been down. And the thing is, the pendulum always swings. And so, when you take a victory lap like that, just remember, well, how would you expect you in four her years. to respond to somebody well, saying that she won she, the popular? Well, in, fair, in fairness, they had, did have Kellyanne was not part of this, but they did have Steve Bannon, who, by his own admission, said that he ran Breitbart, which he quote, quote unquote said was the platform for the alt right. And when you have somebody like that co-managing your campaign, you have somebody in charge who said that he ran the platform for the alt-right. That's just a fact. You can't dispute that. And to some of us, the alt-right is a very repugnant mm. movement that Donald Trump did in right. Hi, I'm Julie Banderas, and welcome to Bias Bash. Trump began his victory tour yesterday in Cincinnati, where he said that everyone, including the media, got his surprising election victory completely wrong. How did the media miss this and how were they backpedaling now that Trump will assume the presidency in January? Joining me now, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author and Fox News contributor Judy Miller. Welcome Judy, thank you very much. And boy, yes, the media did get it wrong, but boy did they love to talk about Trump, whether good or bad, it's all they talked about. Um, break this down for us. Well, look, given the fact that Donald Trump is a master of the media, that he understands exactly what we need, what we want, what audiences want, and given the fact that he has his own independent channel, which is his Twitter forum, mm -hmm. if we fail him, uh, he's in the catbird seat. And you could see that last night in the speech that he gave to celebrate his uh, great victory at saving 800 jobs. That's, you know, better than losing them. But you could see that even though he started out his speech with restraint and a note of unity, he quickly sensed that that wasn't what his audience wanted to hear, and he went into his diatribe against the elites, mm -hmm. and that, of course, includes... And you're media. talking about Carrier. Absolutely. And for those at home that don't deal. understand, so the carrier deal, Trump got involved. That's right. He Here's got a involved. publicly traded business. Mm -hmm. He basically saved 800 jobs. He had hoped to save more. These were jobs that were going to be outsourced to Mexico, yes. which is a tax break for a lot of companies here. He wants to lower the corporate tax uh, rate right now. $11 million dollars is The corporate tax rate in the United States is among the highest That's in the right. world. That's right, and it needs to come down in order it to be competitive. It certainly does. What incentive do you have as a business owner if your corporate tax rate is through the roof? And Absolutely right. We've needed this for a long time. Democrats and Republicans mostly agree that this must be adjusted. But Donald Trump's economic policies still remain to be seen. Now, we've just gotten a look at his financial team. These are very experienced business people mm -hmm. who have no experience in government like the commander-in-chief himself. You know, the policy issue, that is right. key, because economic policy, foreign right. policy, those are specific policies that we haven't heard from. No. This is a little bit of a taste, though, as to what he perhaps wants to see in the future of America, uh, perhaps to, uh, I guess, prohibit 
corporations from outsourcing businesses. But is that even possible? Look, no, you it, can't stop businesses from doing business. You, you can't, and not only that. If you're a Republican, supposedly you don't believe in government, in big government. interfering exactly. in your decisions. And so this is a very atypical Republican, which perhaps is explained by the fact that until recently, Mr. Trump was not a Republican at all. He is a New Yorker. He yep. was a New York liberal who lived here in this city, who supported Planned Parenthood, and who invited Hillary Clinton to one of his marriages. I should also mention he <laughs> also outsourced a lot of his business to China. Exactly. And other countries. Right. Look, the, he is not going to like the media, and ultimately, even though we may find this a very beneficial relationship, we are not going to like him. If we're doing our jobs, right. we've got to hold him accountable, not just for what he says, but also what he does. And that's going to make us unpopular. What do you think it's going to be like to be a White House reporter? Imagine the White House <laughs> briefings once wow. he becomes involved, because he doesn't like people speaking for him. Exactly. I could see a White House briefing taking place where his press secretary is holding one of those daily conferences right. and Trump just walking right in and addressing the media specifically. Or this is going to be a very different White House. Or Julie not addressing us at all, just deciding if he you get on his bad us. side. That's right. Yeah. Or saying, Julie Benderis, you are not invited to the next press yes. conference. You may not attend the next press conference. Anything is possible with Donald Trump. Yeah. Whatever works, whatever keeps the focus on him is, I think, what he's going to do for a while anyway. All right. I think he enjoys that part of the job more than he's going to enjoy actually governing. That's tough. <laughs> yeah, that is tough. And right. certainly you have to allow the media to do their jobs. And well, whether or I'm not sure he likes President it, Obama try. hasn't enjoyed a lot of the questions no. that have been lobbed at him or his press secretary either. Right. But that is part of the job. You have to answer the exactly. questions. They are going to be tough and they're going to be much tougher than some journalists asked him while he was on the campaign trail. Absolutely. I mean, I think that I hope that, that the media are much tougher on, uh, or much tougher than on Donald Trump than they've been to, Bar to Barack Obama because yes. Barack Obama has kind of gotten away yes. with a lot of things that he shouldn't have gotten that away with. That is very true. All right, we'll have to wait and see. Judy Miller, great to see you great as always. You, really. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you on Kid 3. On Kid 3. I'm barely <laughs> awake right now. And to hear more media analysis on this week's top headlines, you can catch Media Buzz with Howard Kurtz on Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern and again at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on the Fox News Channel. I'm Julie Banderas. Thanks for watching.